All right, everyone. Welcome to episode seven of the Summoning Hour with me, Recall, and my guest tonight, uh, May. She is the operations manager of Cloud9, operations director of Heroes Hype, Lady of the Sith, Slytherin, Scorpio, Scorpio, and Tiger. You can definitely see a trend there, right? <laughs> right. Hi, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. A little a little bit of a long week so far, but tomorrow's Friday. Thank God for that. Woohoo indeed. So with that brilliant Twitter profile, people are <laughs> probably going to be wondering like how you got into the games industry, at least from an esports side, and then kind of what your gaming creds are. So maybe tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So, um, I may, uh, I am not like, I would, I always said that I'm not like the traditional like nerd gamer. Um, I didn't like grow up playing video games. I didn't, I don't have that story where like my dad gave me my first computer. I don't have any of that. But those like fun nostalgic things. I, uh, the first time I played a PC game, I was like 22. My boyfriend was like, I'm going to work here, play WoW. And he came back and I was still playing WoW like <laughs> nice. eight hours later. <laughs> so I think that's what's kind of started it. And so I played WoW for a few years and then I, I stopped. I did game for a few years. And then I actually, um, this, I, I don't know if it's kind of an obscure game, but there was this game that came out that was called Star Wars, the Old Republic. It was an MMO. And, um, as ob- the obvious tie in with my bio is I love, I love Star Wars. Um, nice. I would say that Star Wars is actually my true love, but don't tell anybody in esports that. Okay. <laughs> why? Why is there a stigma against Star Wars? No, no, just that like sometimes I feel bad because I feel like people in esports are so like diehard at esports, and I feel like an imposter sometimes because like Star Wars is my love. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> okay, so actually now I have to ask. Yeah. What order do you watch the movies in? What's the proper order? <laughs> Um, like, like, oh, geez. I, I kind of like that machete order thing that they always talk about. I like, I, I like, it's hard because if I, if it was like I had a, a child, right? And I was like introducing them to Star Wars, I would start with a Clone Wars TV show because I think that that's like the most, it would like set you up kind of. And then you would like go into, um, I would do like a new hope. I would just do it the way that it came out, A New Hope, Empire, and then ROTJ, and, like, you would just feel like you would apologize for one, two, three in advance. <laughs> um, I love which, that you threw in the Clone Wars cartoon, because I think that show has been absolutely brilliant. Oh, my gosh. Dave Filoni is a mastermind when it comes to Star Wars. I just, like, I worship at his feet, and I, there's so, the things that the Clone Wars got to explore... Um, and, like, the creative storytelling of that show was just, like, it was absolutely phenomenal. All right, geek cred check. Thanks. <laughs> so let's let's go back to a little bit more of your gaming history. I mean, you played WoW for a few years. You picked up uh, Sotor, and you played that. Yeah, and I it was the first time that I ever I was just playing with friends, and we ended up being like the number one um, like PVE guild in North America, and like number three in the world. So I kind of just got like thrown into oh. This is like a thing, this super competitive, hardcore, try hard gaming thing. It, it wasn't, it was no longer just like, oh, I'm playing with my friend. I'm super, super casual. Yeah. Were um, you aware of esports at that time? Oh, uh, I mean, I was aware that it existed, but I don't know if I had ever watched esports at that point. Okay. So that, that was kind of your introduction to like combat, competitive gaming, not necessarily esports. Totally. Yeah. Competitive gaming. And, and then also like the community behind it. Um, I, I really randomly got asked to be on a podcast by this podcast that was like, I had been around for ages, um, for SOTOR because they had, they had seen that I had done like some, I had responded to some like forum posts and was like, Oh, Hey, like we just cleared this. We were the first ones, blah, blah, blah. So they wanted me to come on and do like a guild spotlight and they really liked me. And so they were like, Hey, you should come back. And I ended up um, being a host on that podcast for like two years. Awesome. And yeah. And that was kind of like my, my foray in the, the greater community that like is behind the game. 
Um, yeah, no, that's really cool. I'll, I'll have to pick your pick your brain for some uh, tips and tricks for running a podcast. <laughs> it's it's definitely hard. <laughs> it is no easy feat to to host a podcast for sure. I mad respect for people that do it. I was just I I got to like be one of the just like the people that showed up every week, which was nice. So, cause I, you know, when you have no idea what you're doing, it's, it's really hard to just like get a grasp of everything that's going on. And the technical side of it can be really, really complicated based on how in depth you want to go. Um, so it was definitely a nice opportunity to like sit back and observe. It was definitely already an established podcast. Like they had like 10,000 listens a month, which is like insane to me. I was like, what do you mean 10,000 people are listening to this? That's incredible. That's really good. Yeah. And so, uh, it was, it was really nice just coming into a community where there was that much support and people like really wanted to hear the information that I had, um, and, and getting to see it from like that angle of, this is the community, like, these are what people in, that are that playing this game alongside of you, like, want to hear about and, and the stories that they care about and, and also the things that they don't like, <laughs> obviously. Right. Now, with that kind of being your introduction, introduction to the greater community behind uh, SOTOR and maybe other games at that time, was that, were you involved with Cloud9 at that point, or was this kind of like your first real foray into things that was my first real foray into things. So did you end up doing any other kind of community spotlighting or kind of joining more in on like forums or other, other groups? Yeah, I definitely got involved in a lot of projects. I I was like super hungry to just like learn everything. I think that that's something that has, that I think is really important is like the ability to kind of like sit back when you join something and observe so you can see the flow of things and you can see how things are supposed to be done. And then you also have that distance to say like, Oh, like it might be better if it happened like this or, Oh, I see that there's something lacking in in the the chain or the flow over here. So I wonder how I could fix that. But um, I I just said yes to everything. Honestly, (laughs) someone was like, Hey, do you want to this? And I was like, sure. I, so I what are did, what are some of those examples of things that you did? Uh so I streamed for one um because we were like a competitive like progression guild. People always wanted to like watch when new content comes out, right? Like people want to watch you you do the attempts, right? For 18 hours. <laughs> oh, you're, totally. You're throwing yourself at a boss. People want to watch that. So I definitely did that. Um that was definitely the when I started to It was really hard for me though. Not that I don't take criticism well but i think that it i being sort of naive until the into the whole scene um definitely didn't prepare me for the amount of like focused uh not like aggression but just like kind of like mean-spiritedness some people can have totally um so i learned that pretty quick and i realized that like maybe that wasn't the best thing for me but then i started doing um a couple websites we're getting built for SOTOR around that time. There was like a database site that needed some help. And also they wanted like some community features, like, uh, just like news. They wanted like a news show. So I did that for them. I would like every week I would do like a five minute, like here's your SOTOR news. And they wanted like a PVP show. So I was like, I can do that. So I just basically said anytime somebody was like, Hey, did you want to do something? Like, you really know what you're talking about and people seem to really know you and respect your opinion. So like, would you like to come talk about it? And I'd just be like, yeah, um, it was, I treated everything like it was an opportunity to learn. And at that point it, it really was for me. Like I had no idea what I was doing. It was, I was all just like treading water, sink or swim, like, let's just do it. And so I did that for a number of years until I just didn't want to play. So they didn't want to play so much anymore. They stopped supporting PDE um, like progression rating. And so I, uh, decided that I wanted to come back to Blizzard. I had always wanted to play League of Legends, but was really intimidated by it. Oh, because me too. It's scary, yo. Like, and then there's like all those runes and masters. They don't have that anymore. But that's how it was. Yeah. No, it's like, I joined in like after, after the craze, everyone started playing and I'm like, okay. I don't have an hour to burn. I don't have an hour to burn to play like an entire game and then like do that six more times in a night. But okay, I'll give it a try. 
I swear, like, I've been playing games since I was, like, four, and I've never felt more out of place in a community, in a competitive competitive game, or in, like, a new genre whatsoever. Like, I was flamed. I had a miserable time. The match lasted, like, an hour and ten minutes, and I was just like, this felt like going to work and having the worst boss in the world. You, like, don't know if you should surrender or not surrender because it's, like, this moral crisis. You're like, I don't really want to give up, but, like, I kind of just want it to be over. Right, exactly. So I know exactly what you went through there. And I, I played one game of League, said, okay, I'm going to go try Dota 2. Tried one game of Dota 2, okay, I'm going to go try... Um, there was another one at the time, and it was just like, no, this genre is not for me at all. And then Heroes of the Storm came out, and that changed everything. Yeah, totally, because you could come in at the beginning, and it was like everybody was kind of on this equal playing field, and you didn't start off behind everyone else. I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I was still really new to the MOBA genre. I mean, I had played collectively like three other games for three three matches, and that was it. That's all I had coming into Heroes of the Storm, so I'm like, maybe this will be better. Maybe. I would, yeah, I would say I had played one League of Legends game before I played on. So I definitely, same boat. Like I, I had no idea what I, I was doing, but it looked pretty, right? Oh, absolutely. And I like that there was different maps from the beginning. I hated the idea of playing one map forever. And the time, the time is so much nicer. Like that you have like between a 11 minute game to like a 31 minute game is like a long game. Well, until they introduce Valkskaya and then oh. throw that out the window. Yeah, and I also, like, I I agree that, like, the macro game being more important, especially from somebody that, like, liked PvE. Totally. Um, the idea of, like, macro game being important and those different contributing factors as far as HOTS is concerned. Um, as far, like, camp pushing and timers and, and like, the, the macro maximization uh, are all really interesting concepts to me. So I definitely, like, respond to that. I like to play, like, Siege Heroes. I love Zagara. I love uh, uh, I love Global Heroes. I love Brightwing. I love, like, ETC. I love Abathur. I like I like Macro Heroes, so. That's awesome. I, I felt like I got stuck playing Support Heroes because I'm a dirty silver pleb and no one ever wanted to heal, so I was like, fine, I'll heal. And so now I have like a thousand matches on Uther alone. Uther's, Uther doesn't feel like a healer. He does, but then you also have that like playmaking ability. Yeah. Yeah. Which like with the support, I love to support. I do. I actually love the support, but I, I only like Uther or Brightwing just because I think they have like playmaking ability. I like being trolly. So like, <laughs> Polly is fun and stun is fun. Like I like being able to like help set up plays and yeah. secure kills. The Polly on like someone like Chogall playing as Brightwing or someone diving in on you is just one of the most satisfying feelings that I, I can think of. Yeah, like when Greymane like vaults in and you're just like, ah, ha, ha, ha. Yep, not exactly. today, Wolf, <laughs> not today. So you were doing a whole bunch of like community spotlighting and helping out. Now, did you end up? using those skills or those kind of community connections to move into HOTS and kind of join Heroes Hype in that direction? So with HOT, I was playing HOTS and I wasn't doing anything in the community at all. I was just kind of like playing the game, kind of stumbling around. I had mentioned to a few people that like, I didn't know anybody in HOTS coming into HOTS. So it was, it was very much like a solo experience for me. I definitely made friends, um, but it was really... It was somebody, Royalite, I don't know if, if you know who she is, probably. I don't. Uh, she's like a like a person, like a Twitter person for Heroes of the Storm and Blizzard games. Um, she was also a tournament organizer for a really long time. They needed casters for an amateur tournament. And she did like a, hey, we're looking for casters for an amateur tournament. Like, people should apply. And somebody who knew me from SWOTOR and also followed her was basically like, man, I think you should do this. I think that you would be really great at it. And I was like, okay, I'll give it a try. <laughs> How hard can it be? It's hard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did not think. I was like, I can talk. I'm a talker. I can talk about the game. Like, I've talked about other stuff. I've been on podcasts. I've been on shows. I 
Like I love sports. Like I understood the like the basic concept. I definitely grew up in a family that like watched a lot of sports on television. Being from Chicago, it's what we do. So, um, we I was just like, okay, yeah, I'll try. And I like submitted a. I don't. I think I submitted something, and they're like, okay this isn't bad, but here's some pointers. And so it was really great when I first started because they, the people that were running it Royal light back then and then some other people, it was um an organization called random CS. And, and this was like pre hero type and they used me for a couple of times. I think the second time I ever cast it, I cast it with J house. So like, that's a crazy experience. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And I learned so much from him and he was so nice. And he put up with the fact that I was terrible. <laughs> um, and he's to this day is the, one of the nicest people in the entire world. I love J how to pieces. And I did that for a little bit. And then I couldn't really cast anymore because I didn't really have the time. Um, but I, they asked if I wanted to help start admining instead. So I was like a lowly tournament admin. And then like th- three months later, I was like head admin and I was like admin manager. Um, I basically just m- made myself available and I was responsible and I worked myself up that ladder pretty quickly. Another one of those times where you didn't say no to anything and you just took it all in stride. Yeah, I definitely, if I can do something, I want to do it. I like to solve problems, um, and I don't like when things don't get done. So I am always just like, yeah, I'll do it. Not a big deal. Um, and I try to make sure that I am really, I don't know, responsible isn't the right word, but like, if I say I'm going to do something, I do it. If I say I'm going to show up, I show up. Um, I think that sometimes in esports, people think like networking is obviously really important and like being friendly is obviously really important. But I think that a lot of times we get lured into the trap of like networking and like being one of the crew is the most important thing when it comes to like succeeding in this. But I really, really believe that, that hard work pays off. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've, I just started writing for Heroes Hype, and so it was just out of that, like, I just decided I needed to be doing more. Like, if I really wanted to be involved in esports, I needed to find some way in. And so I saw the, I think, Artemis Howell posted on Twitter, and I just happened to see it. And it's like, oh, okay, sure, I'll apply to be writing. And so that turned into doing writing once a week. And then from there, I started the podcast. this podcast. I've started doubling down on all my sh- social media stuff to try and get publicity for this. I started this discord server just to try to start building a community. And it's just like, the more I think about it, the more work I can put into this. And it's just, there's always something more to do and something more that I want to build off of and more quality. Like I've never learned more about digital or audio mixing than in the last like two months because I started this podcast. Yeah. And I think that like that attitude, like the, I want to learn attitude is so important. Like I, by no means am a graphic artist, but like if my graphic artist gives me a bunch of files and is like, I don't have time to put this together and this tweet needs to go out, like I can put it together. Or if, you know, I need to do like light coding on the website at this point, like I had somebody who knew what they were doing, teach me what to do so that I could gather all these skills because like you have to be multidimensional. You have to be able to do a little bit of everything because that's just the reality. Like if you want to make yourself indispensable, if you want to make yourself the person that people come to when they need something, um, you have to be able to do stuff and, and you don't have to be, you don't have to go to college for it or you don't have to be trained. But if you have the, like a bare minimum of understanding of something like that takes you really, really far. It's like the Jack of all trades talent <laughs> in D and D, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you just get that plus one and it's like real nice. It comes in handy. And you find more uses for it than you ever thought you would. Totally. And, and so I definitely have that mentality. And I think that learning is, the willingness to learn or be like being receptive to knowledge is a really important thing. I think. Yeah. And one thing I've found is, and just from my time in the games industry is not only that willingness to learn and that open to feedback, but just that, that perspective of 
being coachable, being really malleable, not being so set in your ways that you're not, it's not so much that you're not willing to listen as it is you're not willing to change. Totally. And, and kind of like to die, like to shunt off to the side on that. And the same goes for players, right? Like I think we see this mentality a lot where like a player is, is this star commodity and they, they can be really good so that they don't have to be like multidimensional. Like they don't have to be like team players. They don't have to take care of themselves. They don't have to be responsible. And I think that's, that's not the case. I think that as esports becomes more legitimate and as it becomes bigger, people are going to have to treat it more like reality. Absolutely. And I think with like the NBA 2K season or the draft that happened yesterday, which was really cool to watch. It was like an actual NBA draft. Um, for those who didn't watch it, it sounds like you watched it. That I, I, I watched some of it. Yeah, I watched a few clips from it. I watched and I read like an article of like the with um, Mark Cuban like calling the guy because the Mavs had the first pick, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the NBA 2K League. You have the FIFA League that's kicking off. Like the one of my wife's childhood friends' his brother is now the Seattle Sounders esports player, which is just absolutely crazy to me that that's it's such so a small cool. world. And so, like, with those leagues coming up and, like, pulling these players who have only been in their tight-knit grassroots communities and now putting them in front of the public. And, I mean, we've seen this a little bit with even, like, Overwatch League players where these are people who have never been in the spotlight who are now there and now they're just under that magnifying glass. And we've seen some behavior issues coming out from Overwatch League players. And I can only imagine that those those rules and uh, guidelines for players are going to get more and more specific as everyone starts learning what it means to be an esports athlete and how to direct them. Sure. I totally agree. So we've talked your community movement and how you got into HOTS and how you started seeing some of that back end admin work. But at what point in time and how in the world did you make that jump to Cloud Nine? So I, Eunice, when I came on to Heroes Hype, Eunice um, was sort of coming back and like doubling down on Heroes Hype. And she, um, she works at Cloud9. <laughs> and that helps. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that over probably like, it's probably been like a year and a half um, that they've been maybe two years that they've been in Heroes Hype now and that she's been like really we've been making like lots of moves in Heroes Hype right like we made the goal that we wanted to open and we didn't get it but so like the last year was like working so so hard of making those improvements and things that we need to do um, to to get the open and I think just like in that process she recognized or saw that like I was really passionate about this and that I was responsible and reliable. And when, and, and and it's a thing that is not just like for me, but I think that we do a really good job in heroes hype of we job share a lot. Like so many of the people that are in heroes hype, like really want to be in esports. And so like all the time we're just like posting like of this job opening, this job opening, this job opening. And so um, when she had been sending me things for quite a while, like different positions all around esports that were like operations management because at that that's what I've been doing for about the past year now for Heroes Hype is operations management. And so like, you know, anytime there was one something that like looked like it was something that I could I wanted to do or I could do, she was passing it along to me. And a lot of them are like outward facing roles. So as far as like, you know, like uh like sponsorship reps or for like peripheral or hardware companies or esports coordinators or things like that. Yeah. But I I, um, I definitely feel like I excel more on like inward facing things, like the back end. Uh, I sometimes call, call myself like a Varus. Like I, I like to be like behind <laughs> the scenes way more. Like I, everything going past me. I love like all the information. And so like knowing everything that's happening and having like my fingers and a little bit of everything. So I um, feel you. I feel you as, as a producer, I, I'm in our Jira database. All day, every day, and I know what everyone's working on just so that I feel like I could answer a question if someone should have the most obscure question about our project. Definitely, yeah. And and being able to, like, have that security that 
I know what's going on. So like I can make educated like responses or you have that, that big picture. So you like, you can direct where things go um, like in future planning. So I really, I really liked the inward facing stuff. And when the job opening sort of like came up at cloud nine, um, I applied and I am really lucky that I have worked with like a lot of really great people, like in my career, as far as like from starting out as casting to, to like, you know, help, helping run here aside with Eunice, um, that I've met a lot of people who I are, that I recognize early as being like really respectable people that like drama doesn't follow them. Like they very just are just like put their like nose to the grindstone, like work the work types. And I think those people don't get like the flashy shows all the time, but I think that it's like the quiet ones that you like remember. So I had a lot of people that like were really willing to write really wonderful, like letters of recommendation. Yeah. And and that goes back to all those qualities that you mentioned earlier, being able to solve problems, being reliable, having good networking skills, that willingness to learn multidimensional, like all of that stuff catches back up to you when you want to ask for help. Definitely. And the fact that I think that I, I didn't, I think that being confident is really important, but I think that sometimes there's a lot of ego in esports, and I, I am mindful um, of not asking for things all the time for people. <laughs> asking when it matters, you know? Exactly. I mean, like every time you ask for something from someone, you're, you're basically saying at some point in time, you should be able to come ask me for a favor. And if you're not going to be good for that, then people are going to just realize that you're just mooching off of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about building those relationships. Yep. And it's really important because I mean, this industry is all about relationships. It is about relationships, you know, everyone, because it's growing at such a fast pace and because like there's so many opportunities that are happening, like you never know when like something new is going to happen and someone's going to go, Oh, you should talk to so-and-so because they're really good at this. And like, we need someone to do this. Yeah. I had one, I went to GDC a couple of weeks ago and I was talking with one of my publishing um, guys and he introduced me to one of the guys who helped make uh, Redneck Rampage, which was like my brother's and my favorite game outside of Doom when we were growing up. And it's like, this guy helped make it. And I just got introduced to him. And then he's saying, yeah, I'll come on your podcast and be like, I'll tell you all the stories of like games industry stuff from the 90s. And it's like oh out gosh. of nowhere that this guy just came out of. And it's like, I just made like a treasure trove of like stories to share with people. And that's. You you just never know who you're going to meet when you're being good to other people and you're, they're helping you network. And I think that uh, people are really, for the most part, I think people are really good at telling if someone is, like, disingenuous or, like, honest or if they have integrity. or And integrity is, like, a big one for me. Um, like, is, with Heroes Hype, we've always tried to, like – to make integrity the number one thing. Like we never want anyone to look at us and be like, and can, they could honestly like accuse us of favoritism or say that we like, you know, change things, like pulled a switcheroo or that we ever weren't going to pay anybody. Like that's really important because like once trust is broken, it's very hard to get back. Absolutely. But if, if you operate under like being held at, to that standard is really important and you keep yourself there. I think that it like in, ingratiates you with people maybe. Oh yeah. I mean, the pr- proof is in the pudding and when you can show that you're consistent and consistently good, people will like register that and keep that in their mind. Even if they stop interacting with you or your organization, they'll always, whenever they're reminded of it, they'll be like, Oh yeah, they were pretty good. Weren't they? And and the same was like the, with the personal, like when you meet people that are genuine and, and are coming to you for help and they, and they're, or asking you for a favor and they seem honest about it, it makes you want to say yes. Because like the nice thing about esports is like, mo- for the most part, like we're really supportive of each other. Like there's like, there's all this drama and stuff, but I think that that's just like the layer most people that I've met in esports have been absolutely wonderful. And like, I would not be anywhere that I would be today without uh, like a thousand people who helped me. And so 
like I'm cognizant of that. And it makes me be like, okay, like these people all affected my life and changed my life and gave me these opportunities. Like, and in any ways that I can, like, I want to pass it on because like, there's so much space in esports for everybody because it's growing so much that like, there's no reason for people to be like jealous or secretive or, or not help other people around them. I'm so glad you mentioned that because, I mean, that's a lot of the same attitude I've been taking towards a lot of my Instagram kind of posts and even these podcasts. I really want to introduce multiple disciplines to different people so that they know that there is a job for them in the games industry or in esports. And so, I mean, some of the unsung heroes, at least at uh, the studios I've worked at, have been the ops and the ops managers. Um, maybe could you describe like some of your responsibilities that you do kind of day to day just to kind of show that it, you don't have to be like crazy technical. You don't have to always just be in the midst and know everything that's going on, but like, you know how to support folks. And I mean, maybe take it a different flavor because maybe you've run ops differently than how I've experienced it. Uh, so I would say that like the thing that I do most is I, I fact check, not even fact check. I just make sure that everything is correct. I, I live in spreadsheets. Um, I live in spreadsheets because I'm dealing with sponsors and players, mostly like the, the org side of it. Um, so, and then I also like deal with travel. So if people have to go places, you know, there's so many moving pieces besides just players. When it comes to an org, there's content and managers and coaches and physical therapists and um, sports psychologists and counselors and nutritionists and, you know, culture coaches and translators that all those people and support staff have to get everywhere as well. Um, And I'm, yeah, and I'm really, I'm really lucky that I, I work for C9 because they are such an amazing org. And I don't just say that because I work there, like they, they care about their players. Um, it's great having Jack at the, like the helm who, who loves esports, like somebody that working under somebody who's passionate is such an important thing to me. Um, like I'm a very passionate person. So I respond to that. Like if everyone around me is passionate, like I want to be passionate too. Like I am passionate. And I think that that sort of that passion, like fuels passion and you like light other people's fires and you, and you keep that fire raging. And so it's, it's really cool that we have that. Everybody that I work with is, is very passionate. And so, um, yeah, I organize a lot of things. <laughs> My job is to make sure that people are where they need to be and things are done at the right time and that um small things don't fall through the cracks um i just get like a lot of like messages that like can you remember this and like i have to remember it and two months down the line when it was like can you remember it till then like i'm the person that's like okay we had to remember this like let's remember and deal with it damn if it wasn't for a jira database and having like week or daily stand-ups with my teams there's no way i could remember stuff two months down the road i, like, I live in spreadsheets <laughs> yeah man that's that sounds horrible and satisfying at the same time <laughs> it's definitely a personality thing i think that um i i really like that i and i i like triple quadruple checking things <laughs> and you know if you're gonna do something you might as well do it right the first time Totally. Exactly. And, you know, all the T's being dotted and all the I's or uh, other way, all the I's being dotted and T's being crossed. Like that's basically, that's part of what I do. So a fun story that came from my trip to GDC. So I, I work at Wargaming and so we have a lot of studios all around the world and, uh, we were shipping, I think it was like 45 people out from the Frankfurt airport. And now there's one travel coordinator who is coordinating, I think it was close to 70 people going out to GDC for more gaming. And she, so she was coordinating everyone. And this is multinational, uh, international travel. And for, uh, it was like 45 people, 40, 45 people were all on the same plane from Frankfurt the night before, or it was Sunday before GDC started. And three hours into their flight out of Frankfurt, they had to turn around. <gasps> yeah, that's a nightmare. Oh, and geez. then, because most of them weren't from Germany or had an appropriate passport for that area, none of them could leave the airport. 
to go to a hotel, which was supposed to compensate them for their flight being turned around and grounded. Right. By, let's see, the, their flight was supposed to be like 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. By 8 o'clock when I was uh, down in California, we had found out that they had only found flights for like 14 of them. Yeah, and, that sounds about right. Yeah, that's, oh man, the, the, our travel coordinator, God bless her, she, she, I found her with two cups of coffee in her hand. She had just traveled herself, uh, to get out to GDC and she was probably up until two, three in the morning just making sure everyone got a flight. Yeah, and it's, it is, yeah, I'm gonna pull my hair out sometime. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that just means you care about your job and you want to do it right. Yeah, and, like, it's little things I know. Like, I'm like, oh, geez. Like, I'm empathetic. I don't want to be, like, a 19-hour flight versus, like, a 26-hour flight. Like, oh, I want to get them on, like, the 19-hour flight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, like, we're sending, you know, because, like, you know, the, from Korea and everywhere. Like, it's it's crazy to me that some of the teams travel so much. It, like, it blows my mind. I can't even believe it. Like, just they're just like on the road, and, like you know, from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, and it's like it's in, it's inspiring because like I don't know how I would have the stamina. I mean, I get it's really cool because you get to like see the world and you're doing what you love, and it's it's definitely like a whirlwind. But even like traditional sports don't travel as much as some esports players are traveling. I mean, like there, there's like the long baseball seasons or even like the NBA seasons, but they're, they're traveling relatively locally, like to and from within three hours. And they're usually home by like the following day. You have people in esports boot camping for two weeks in a foreign country and having to rely on other people to make sure that they have food, that they get to their locations for training, for all of their practices for, and then getting back to the hotel safely. So uh, that's insane. There was this thing that happened a few weeks ago. Um, there was like a Counter Strike tournament in China, and the so that the tournament, like the tournament, usually books the travel for the players and and like the manager and the coaches. And so they get there, and the hotel was just like the hotel that they had booked canceled all their reservations at the last minute, and they put them in this oh, no. different hotel. And the hotel had like mold on the walls they had like metal support frames in the hallways i think like, i saw some of this sagging. on twitter yeah it was on twitter and i just like couldn't believe it and it was like it was like it was okay for our team because like they they just the, like we just the manager went and got him a hotel like that was nearby and they did they, they were fine but there there was other players there and other teams that like don't have orgs behind them they had to stay in those places God. And it's just like, oh, it makes you feel so bad. Like, and then, and here these athletes, like, they're competing. Like, can you imagine? I mean, I, I guess the same thing happened in the Olympics. But, like, could you imagine, like, for the Super Bowl, like, if those players, like, didn't have their, like, cushy suites and things like that? Yeah. Like, it's, Absolutely. Man. It's definitely the Wild West still in a lot of ways for esports. Yeah. So, what's some of the, what, what's the most interesting thing to you happen in esports right now? So I'm personally really invested in Overwatch League. I I like love the format. Um, I love like that it's at the arena that they like have done the same thing as sort of like Riot with LCS. Um, that there's like this centralized place for it that they have all these events happening all over the all over the world, right? When the teams play, I love that like transition to traditional sports, which are city based locations, like to build those communities that are geographically based around places. Yeah, I I really like the geolocation idea that they've put into uh, Overwatch League. I, I can't. I hope someone puts together a Seattle team. I would go to that. Every week, if if available, that would be amazing. I mean, people are interested. I I really think I don't think in any ways that it's it'll be if <laughs> if they don't allow any more teams and it's going to be really hard to manage it. 
But if they, you know, if they have like 20, 24 teams, 30 teams, it becomes much easier because then you have regions, right? Then we have like three team, three or four teams in Europe and like 10 teams in Asia and Australian teams and those teams all play together. So it's not so yeah. long for them to, to travel. And then there's already tons of any teams, but yeah, I, I would say that a Seattle team, like a Seattle team, a Chicago team are probably incoming. And like probably like a few more teams. I I would say, I not that I know anything, right? But I would say they. <laughs> right. I but I know that people are like one in. Like there's all those rumors of like the thirteenth team that wanted in and things like that. Right. So, like I think that people are ready and willing, and I think that how excited people are, um, definitely matters. I think with Fortnite being just so popular that it, like, is another focus on esports that people are like, oh, okay, maybe this. Maybe this is like a a thing that we should look at. I'm really interested in hearing how groups and orgs will solve the spectating issues that comes with a game that has a hundred players or twenty five different teams all playing at the same time. Because it, it seems like there's not enough time to develop those player or team narratives, considering that the matches are like thirty minutes long and you only have so many spectators. Unless you're just going to let people go free for all in that match and just let thousands of people in to spectate and do their own. Yeah, I think that they, I think with those games that they, it, it depends on the developer, right? Like if the developer wants that openness, they're going to put in it so that everyone can see. Yeah. I definitely but, think Epic's in a better spot to support that and solve that problem more so than, um, who is it? Blue Hole? whoever yeah. does PUBG. Yeah, and I also think that there's, like, I believe in, like, staged rollout, too. Like, I don't think that there's anything... Once something's out, it's out. Like, you can't put it back in the bag. But <laughs> right. there's nothing There's nothing wrong with being like, okay, like, we're going to try this, and then we're going to we're gonna let it... We're going to build a program that allows people to do it, like, if they have this capability. And then they give it to, like, tournament organizers first. And then they give it to, like, orgs or other groups, and they, like, and they slowly roll it out. Um, or they just release it to everybody and people just do it as they want. But I think it's, it's hard to control. I don't know. Can they put a delay on that? I don't know how it works necessarily. Um, I don't know if they could actually do a delay in client and let people spectate it that way. I don't know, but Twitch has done some crazy stuff with extensions that they were showing off. Um, like if you were playing Hearthstone on stream, a, a viewer could then mouse over your cards uh, and see what all the cards were in, like, as if they were sitting in the same client. So there may be stuff like that coming that Twitch is just able to support as a platform that game developers themselves haven't been able to. Hmm, that'd be interesting. Yeah, because I guess, like, it really comes down to, like, how, what is the margin of of how can this be exploited, right? Yeah, exactly. Like as a tournament organizer, like that's what I think about all the time. I'm like, all right, so how can someone mess this? Like, how can how can you know somebody mess this up? How can they take it, make it so the whole class can't have like nice things? Like, <laughs> you have to outthink the players. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's what QA is for. Definitely. <laughs> So aside from Overwatch League, is there anything that you're paying close attention to, whether it's Heroes of the Dorm, HGC, um, or just another game? So I definitely am interested in Heroes stuff because I'm really involved in that space. Uh, I'm kind of interested in MTG Arena, but I like don't want to say it out loud because I don't want to admit it to myself because I like do not want to go down that hole. I used to play like Magic a lot. <laughs> A lot. So, <laughs> and I love it, but, um, it's such a time sink. So I'm afraid if I get back into like a TCG, I will not do anything else. Oh yeah. It's easy to just fall into that and then just start throwing money away and just like, I need this so that I can do this and then have the best deck that you rarely ever get to play. <laughs> yeah. And like, I think that the thing that has held me off on Hearthstone so much is that, like, you didn't have the physical cards, and there's just something so beautiful about magic cards. Like, I I don't even play that much anymore, but I have, like, one deck, and I have, like, my rare binder, because, like, they're just cards that I can't get rid of, because they're just, like, beautiful. Absolutely. I mean, I still have uh, my green 
what is it, Chub Toad from oh. like the late nineties, early two thousands, just because I liked the poem that was on it. Those were the game shop magic days were definitely like I look back on them fondly in my nerd dumb. So you'll admit to playing magic, but you have a hard time admitting to people that you that you're a Star Wars nerd. I don't they don't like to admit it. I have like two Star Wars tattoos. It's pretty hard. To okay, yeah. It, okay, well then, yeah, it's not really a hard time then. <laughs> I have I have um Obi Wan's Jedi Knight symbol from the Clone Wars, like that rust red one. Nice. And then I have a Death Star in the shape of a heart. That's fun. Yeah. <laughs> Any particular meaning behind those? I mean, I, Obi-Wan's probably, like, one of my favorite characters. I love him in Clone Wars. I just love the, his dialogue, like the smarmy British guy. Um, if they don't cast Ewan McGregor for, their, for like, the new movie, I'll be done with the new Star Wars franchise. That's my that's my line in the sand. <laughs> um, and then, I don't know, I really... I like the juxtaposition of, like good and bad so like the idea of a heart with the death star is intriguing to me that is fun (laughs) yeah i like i like the bat the baddies i love the um the psychology of baddies if that makes sense yeah no i mean villains always have more fun i mean it's it go back to um uh who was it matthew mcconaughey's joker was, no, not Matthew McConaughey. Heath Ledger, but yeah, yeah. Heath Ledger, that saying. one. But There's like, just so much more depth. Oh, yeah. Now, if you had to pick a villain from, like, any Blizzard IP, who would be your favorite one to see on, like, the silver screen? Does it have to be a villain? I mean, like, what is a villain? Like, is Sylvanas a villain? Kind of. I, I, I could see... Sylvanas being kind of the anti-hero kind of good point I I, 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 I would accept Sylvanas oh gosh I don't know Um, I think Arthas is pretty cool Arthas would be fantastic it would look good you know yeah I mean even just covering that story from Prince Arthas to the drawing to the Ice Crown Citadel and then putting the hat on, the helmet on, like, and then that transformation, that would be pretty fucking sweet. <laughs> and, like, I liked the first Warcraft, the Warcraft movie, like, it, mixed reviews or whatever. Like, I was thoroughly entertained. I watched it pretty frequently. Like, it makes me happy. <laughs> I would, oh, you know. yeah. I mean, cool Dan, you cannot go wrong. Yeah. And, like, I love, see, and I like that movie because you empathized with, like, the orcs more than the humans. And, like, that's so interesting to me that they, through CGI, through all of that, like, that was the better story. And it just, like, storytelling and, and heart are just, like, and soul are just really important things. I think Blizzard was just making up for the fact that Horde got shafted in the story in uh, WoW. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> and then, so is that why we get all, like, the really bomb Sylvana stuff now? Yeah, that's probably exactly it. People are like, oh, everyone likes Sylvana's. Let's do cool stuff with her. I cried at BlizzCon when they did that, when they had that trailer. Oh, the battle for Azeroth? Oh my gosh, I just like, I started bawling right there. <laughs> there there's worse scenes that you could have started bawling at, but yeah, that's pretty cool. It was emotional because I'm a Horde girl. It's I'm for the Horde all the way. I've never made an Alliance character. I will. I will admit, I made a uh, gnome rogue while I was waiting for Burning Crusade to come out because I was sitting maxed out on my undead warlock, and I'm just like, man, I'm bored. I don't feel like grinding like rep or anything like that. So, okay, I'll just grind out a, a dirty, filthy gnome rogue, and I hated my entire time doing that. Yeah, and they're pretty cities. It's so dumb. I agree. <laughs> Well, is there anything that you would like to spit out there for anyone who's looking to get into, like, esports or um, community work or games industry type stuff? 
or maybe just your contact information in case you want to let people know that they can send you messages and questions. Definitely. Um, I would say for anybody out there who wants to get into esports that being yourself and being empathetic and working hard and listening are uh, the ways to success. I don't know. What can you say the ways to success? It's like, uh, uh, it, those are important. I think it, the putting your head down and working hard gets noticed more than running in a room and screaming. And I think that um, if people just like stay true to themselves and remember to be good to each other, that I think that that goes a really far way. Um, and uh, you could find me on Twitter at maybe buzz, M A E B E E B U Z Z. And my DMS are open and I'm always around to answer any questions or give feedback or, you know, whatever. And worst case scenario, you join the heroes hype discord channel and talk to either one of us yeah and if for anybody like if you ever go to any events we always do really fun heroes hype things we'll be at dorm and we'll be doing a meetup um we'll do a meetup at pax west and we'll do a meetup at blizzcon too so we're like a, we're definitely a community that is for everybody to come in and hang out if you love heroes and you love supporting um, amateur heroes pro heroes people who love heroes then you should check us out. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming out and doing this interview with me. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. And I think that is it. So I will see everyone else next week with my next podcast. I don't have a guest lined up quite yet, but I'm sure I'll figure that one out. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time.